Against the dark background of the atomic bomb, the United States does not wish merely to present strength, but also the desire and the hope for peace. On August 15, 1958, the New York Times reported that a mobile laboratory was loaded yesterday aboard ship for the International Atoms for Peace show to be held in Geneva in September. The article about the first-of-its-kind mobile laboratory came with an impressive picture of a more than 10 meters long, bus-like vehicle hanging from a crane in front of the American Archer, a U.S. container line ship built only four years earlier. The photo caption was telling, this mobile training laboratory is one of two the U.S. is giving to the International Atomic Energy Agency. A massive techno-scientific artifact, the mobile laboratory was one of the country's technological miracles designed to instruct up-and-coming scientists and engineers across the globe in detecting and measuring radioactive materials. In the end, the mobile labs enabled the IAEA to gain control, both epistemic and material, over the process of standardizing laboratory procedures related to the radioisotopes and other nuclear material and research techniques. As the Cold War competition with the Soviet Union dominated U.S. foreign policy, Americans used nuclear science and technology as major national assets in their international affairs. Radioisotopes represented the nation's most important application of atomic energy in the long run. Already in 1946, the U.S. government utilized one of its first reactors at Oak Ridge to produce radioisotopes. They were then made available for purchase to medical facilities and other civilian institutions in the country. Part of the energy can be stored in materials that release this energy over long periods in the form of radiation. They are known as radioisotopes and are ordinary materials like cobalt, gold and phosphorus which have been made radioactive. At the same time, the numerous requests from scientists outside the United States put the country's Atomic Energy Commission under pressure to make the political decision of whether it should or even could export radioisotopes. As the AEC advertised in 1948, isotopes for scientific, medical, agricultural, and industrial use constitute the first great contribution of atomic energy to peacetime welfare. Industrial power from nuclear energy may be a decade or longer in the future, and most other applications are still largely speculative. But isotopes produced in the Atomic Energy Establishment at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, are already at work in more than 300 laboratories and hospitals in this country and abroad. As tracers, they are proving themselves the most useful new research tool since the invention of the microscope in the 17th century. From 1946 to 1950, the first five years of the isotope distribution program, the AEC sent 11,400 domestic shipments of radioisotopes. 45% were used in medical therapy, 27% in animal physiology research, and only 3.7% in industrial research. Iodine-131 and phosphorus-32 alone accounted for about two-thirds of all accumulated sales. According to the AEC commissioner, in 1953, it was estimated by the AEC that radioisotopes were saving American industry about $100 million per year, and it was predicted that the saving might reach 10 times that amount within the next decade. Given the enormous growth in radioisotope demand but also profit, the U.S. National Defense Education Act of 1958, NDEA, recognized the existence of an educational emergency and called for the development as rapidly as possible of those skills essential to the national security and the promotion of radioisotopes. Additionally, the U.S. Congress took a stand in defining training programs for scientists and engineers and promoted the use of publicity through television and film as part of the educational campaign. The day Soviet scientists jauntily drop-kicked the first Sputnik around the world, the average American was shocked, bewildered, and resentful. But the men who cope with mob scenes like this, our harassed U.S. college administrators, were not surprised. On Sputnik Day, President Eisenhower's committee report on higher education rivaled Russia's march-stealing moon as a cause for concern on every campus. Beyond these student throngs, three million in all, are more than 200,000 each year of our ablest high school graduates who must get along without higher education. 
The U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, AEC, adopted similar propaganda and educational techniques to legitimize atomic energy on a national level and educate pupils and the public at large. By the late 1950s, it had even initiated an ambitious program of traveling exhibitions known as the Atoms for Peace mobile campaign that toured the country. According to the U.S. House of Representatives, the program served as a major instrument of public information concerning peacetime developments of atomic energy. Staff from the Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies, a nonprofit educational corporation of 37 colleagues and universities, undertook the design and preparation of the innovative mobile units that carried the exhibits. The mobile units required a display area of about 6,000 square feet, a walkthrough exhibit with self-contained and truck trailers. They proved to be enormously effective propaganda by enabling a large number of people to see the promised peaceful nuclear future in practice. Following the success of the traveling mobile exhibitions across the country, the AEC sought to reveal the majesty of its nuclear technologies on an international level. During the first Geneva Conference on the Peaceful Use of Atomic Energy in 1955, the AEC exhibited a similar mobile unit functioning as a laboratory that attracted 25,000 visitors. Mobile exhibits proved to be an exceptionally successful tool in promoting their political messages. As AEC's exhibit program was expanding, the staff at Oak Ridge undertook one more task, designing two mobile laboratories. The unit was designed by physicist Ralph Overman, chairman of the Special Training Division of the Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies. Lincoach and Truck Corporation took over the construction. The company specialized in custom-made coaches for U.S. customers and international markets in Latin America. The two laboratories were identical. They were about 10 and a half meters long and weighed 13 tons. The lab was connected to a power supply line, which could be connected to a building or the vehicle's 10 kilowatt petrol generator. The size of the lab and the available equipment were sufficient to train six people simultaneously, divided into three pairs. Each of these units consisted of a chemical laboratory and a radiation measuring room installed inside the vehicle. The United States' decision to donate two mobile laboratories to the newly established International Atomic Energy Agency was strongly aligned with the United States' political and diplomatic interests. My government is ready to make these laboratories available as a gift. U.S. Representative Robert McKinney told Sterling Cole, the agency's director general, while presenting a small-scale model of the Mobile Radioisotope Laboratory. The model remained on display at the agency's headquarters, and the local press reported extensively on the event. These laboratories will enable the agency to provide training comparable to that now being given at the Oak Ridge Institute of Nuclear Studies in the United States emphasized McKinney. The provision of international technical assistance became essential to the IAEA's developmental policy, which implemented a dispatch of science experts and technological devices to assist states worldwide on a number of issues. The circulation of the two mobile labs for the promotion of radioisotopes around the globe was one of the IAEA's earliest technical assistance programs. Throughout its first decade, the agency significantly influenced the development of the radioisotope market. It was instrumental in introducing norms and standards for the entire production and distribution chain. Most importantly, it shaped the use of radioisotopes in the developing world. Mobility mattered. Mobility of the laboratory will enable it to be taken quickly from one city to another and thus enable scientists, who otherwise would not have access to it, to avail themselves of the training courses. On August 14, 1958, the first mobile laboratory embarked on its transatlantic voyage to Europe. It was scheduled to be exhibited at the first UN International Conference on the Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy in Geneva in September 1958. From September 1st to 13th, the laboratory was part of the U.S. commercial exhibit running parallel to the conference, where more than 50 American firms showcased their latest nuclear technologies. Although this particular lab was donated to the IAEA, it served as an exemplar to generate commercial interest and attract sales. During the exhibit, the U.S. government planned to keep the laboratory open for as complete an examination as possible by interested persons. Fixed on the side of the superstructure was a bronze plaque stating that the mobile unit was a gift of the United States to the IAEA for the use of research work. By the end of September, during the second IAEA General Conference, the mobile unit reached the IAEA headquarters in Vienna. On September 24, 1958, John A. McCone, 
chairman of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, presented the first mobile isotope laboratory to the IAEA in a splendid ceremony in front of the Hofburg Palace in Vienna. The mobile labs became the most prominent artifacts of the IAEA's early technical assistance program. The IAEA promoted their use to all its member states as an economic means for training a large number of professionals, technicians, and advanced students in a short time, and in courses designed to have specific reference to the medical and other scientific problems of the area in which the training is conducted. The first mobile lab began its tour in Europe in March 1959, starting in Greece and visiting Yugoslavia and the Federal Republic of Germany. It then moved on to Asia and the Far East, where it traveled from 1960 to 1963, visiting a total of 14 cities in the Republic of Korea, China, the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Singapore. Finally, in 1965, it went to Africa, specifically to Ghana, where it visited three cities over the span of four months. From 1958 to 1965, this unit was used in a total of 11 countries and 26 different cities. The second mobile lab began its journey in January 1960 in Mexico, where it remained until April. It then toured three different cities in Argentina. Its next destinations were Uruguay and Brazil, followed by Bolivia, before returning to Brazil. It was stored in Brazil for the next three years before arriving at its final destination, Costa Rica, where it was established as a part of the plan to eliminate the Mediterranean fruit fly. From 1960 to 1965, this mobile laboratory visited a total of 22 cities. Until 1965, about 1,500 people participated in these training courses. The overall costs of the agency for the two mobile labs during the eight years from 1958 to 1965 amounted to $123,900. This total expenditure for the labs was relatively low, representing not more than 0.7% of the technical assistance expenditure provided by the agency over the same period, which amounted to $16,633,000. The mobile unit became an indispensable ingredient of the IAEA's International Affairs and Development Plan. It played a central role in creating global connections and networks, establishing a shared material culture among global centers of interest, unfolding political and diplomatic practices, and standardizing societal and scientific culture across the globe. The mobile labs together with the agency's myriad of other material devices crossed continents and formed the backbones of early technical assistance programs designed to further the international organization's developing goals in the Global South while ensuring the nuclear privileges of the Global North. Music